So now we're going to talk about some of the kind of interesting things we can do once we've estimated a logit model or, or really any structural model, but we'll talk about the specifics of a logit model here, which is think about simulating counterfactuals and calculating welfare. Those are two of the advantages that we talked about of, of, a, of having a structural model, right? So when we talk about counterfactual simulations, what we mean is that um, we might want to compare outcomes between our observed empirical setting and some alternative setting where there's some policy change that shifts around attributes or data. Maybe it shifts around choice sets. Maybe it even changes the structural parameters a little bit. The changing structural parameters is, is less common, but um, you know, in the first week we talked about horizontal mergers. And sometimes you might think that a horizontal merger would lead to some, some additional cost efficiencies. And so maybe the underlying technology of firms is changing. Uh, in cases like that, you might actually think about changing structural parameters. Uh, more, more common, though, is going to be changing either attributes and data or changing the choice set. So just some examples here, uh, you know, you might want to estimate the demand for education because ultimately you want to simulate the effects of a school voucher program. Or maybe you want to estimate how farmers choose which crop to plant in order to simulate the effects of a groundwater sustainability policy. Or maybe you want to estimate the labor, uh, the supply of labor, in order to simulate the effects uh, of an income tax change. So kind of three different fields there. We've got education, labor kind of stuff. We've got kind of labor public and we've got kind of ag resource. Uh, in, in all of these cases, you know, counterfactual simulations could, could be really useful in answering our research question. So if we're using the logit model, one of the things we care about the most is how people make choices. And so we want to simulate what would choices be under different different settings, different, different, you know, different data, for example. Well, remember, we cannot simulate or predict discrete choices with certainty, but we can use choice probabilities to talk about kind of the expectations of choices. So if we think about y sub ni as being this binary variable, if and only if n chooses i, then our expectation about y is the choice probability. This is more kind of like definitional than anything. And we have an expression to represent, to represent those choice probabilities. Well, then if we're thinking about how do choices change due to a change in attributes or a change in the choice set, then we can just express the change in the expect expectation of a decision maker's choice as ca the capital delta here means change. The change in the expectation is just the choice probability where the superscript one here means in the counterfactual minus the choice probability in our observed empirical setting. So it's as simple as just calculating a choice probability using the new data, the new choice set, whatever the case might be, calculating the choice probability in the original setting using our data and just taking the difference between those two. That's going to tell us kind of in expectation, how is a decision maker's choice going to change due to this, this change that we're thinking about simulating. I want to highlight one thing here. You have to calculate choice probabilities for both the, uh, the counterfactual and for the original setting. You can't like calculate choice probabilities and then compare that to observed choices, for example, because then you're, cal you're comparing a probability to an actual one zero variable and that just doesn't work. We need to make sure to kind of quote unquote simulate choice probabilities in both the simulated, uh, in both the counterfactual setting and in our original observed empirical setting. And something that's, that can be easy to do to think about, oh, let me simulate the, the counterfactual but then you kind of forget that you also need to, to do the same thing to the original setting. Okay, usually we, we might not care about how any one individual changes their choice. I mean, maybe we do, but oftentimes, at least I, I find, what we care more about is how aggregate choices are changing. How is the total number of people making choice one versus choice two? How is that changing? 
And so let's call that capital A for like aggregate choices. Then our expectation about the capital A, well, we can just take the expectation about every individual in our data set and add those up. So our expectation about how many people are gonna, how many decision makers will choose alternative I is just equal to summing up the choice probabilities for I over all of our different decision makers. That tells us in expectation how many people are choosing that alternative. But we don't just wanna know that. Usually we wanna know how does that change when we change the choice setting in some way, when we have this new counterfactual to think about. And so we can think about the change in the expectation of aggregate choices as just being summing up all the choice probabilities in the counterfactual data or counterfactual choice set or whatever the case might be, sum those up over everyone, subtract that, subtract from that the sum of the original choice probabilities over all individuals. So it's just like the last slide. We calculate the choice probability for every individual in both the, uh, the counterfactual setting and in the original setting, and then we just add them up. And that kind of tells us how many people do we expect to be choosing alternative I in the counterfactual? How many people do we expect to be choosing counterfact uh, alternative I in the original setting? And then just take the difference between the two. Um, and this is one reason why, why the logit model is so nice is because calculating these probabilities is just really easy. It's this really simple uh, expression. We could, we could code it up in R. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll see there are some functions that'll do it for us, but even if we had to calculate, calculate these ourselves, they're, they're pretty simple uh, mathematical expressions to calculate. So that's how we can think about uh, kind of simulating how individual choices or aggregate choices are changing in expectation due to, due, due to some change. We also might care about how welfare is changing. And in particular, with the logit model, we're going to think about how consumer surplus is changing. How is the surplus to the decision makers changing because of some change in the data, the pol a policy change that affects the, the choices available, whatever the case might be. So just a reminder, when I say surplus or consumer surplus, we're talking about the monetary gain to a consumer from purchasing a good for less than the value the consumer places on the good. So the consumer has some value for, for a good. They have to pay less than that to actually purchase the good. And the difference between those two gives us consumer surplus. In this case, you're, it, we might not be thinking about consumers per se, right? If you're, if you're making the discrete choice of how to commute to work, that's not, a, you're not going to the store and you know, you're not buying something in a market per se, but, uh, but th there's still an analogy here which is that you're, you're getting some value out of the choice you make, and that is your surplus. So if we know the marginal utility of income for decision maker N, let's call that alpha sub N. So we need to know the marginal utility of income. But if we know that, then the consumer surplus that decision maker N gets from a given choice setting is just uh, this expression here. So what our random utility model tells us is that decision maker is going to choose the, the alternative that maximizes their utility. So we just pick the alternative that maximizes utility. Whatever that utility is, we scale it by marginal utility of income. And that essentially converts utility to dollars. And this is going to give us a dollar expression for how much surplus the decision maker is getting. The problem here is we don't actually observe U. That's the problem with all of this and why we even need a random utility model. We don't observe U, but we can know it in expectation. Once again, we're having to talk about expectations here. We plug in representative utility and random utility, and then we can take the expectation of that. And there's some math that goes into this. It's not even in the book, but the book has the references uh, to point you to the papers that talk about this. If we assume that utility is linear in income, so we're just saying that, that this is a, a constant parameter for each individual. If that's true, then our expected consumer surplus to decision maker N 
is this expression here, where we're taking the exponential of the representative utility for each alternative, summing up those exponentials, and then taking the log of it, and then scaling that by alpha. We also have this extra constant term over here because we kind of never know what someone's underlying utility or surplus might be. Um, so we kind of have to account for the fact that, that, that we're, we're only estimating essentially changes in, in utility or surplus and not, not actually kind of like raw levels. Um, but but that's the, you, you'll see this, the, this term doesn't actually matter at all. What matters is this piece right here. Uh, you may notice the thing inside the parentheses is the denominator of our choice probability. Uh, it just kind of happens that way. There's no real economic intuition for why the denominator of the choice probability equals the um, equals the, uh, the kind of is, is this important term in our consumer surplus calculation, but it just happens to be. Uh, oftentimes you'll see this, this whole term, including the log. This is called the log sum term because it's the log of the sum of the exponentials. So this whole thing is the log sum term. We just scale that by alpha and we've got our expected consumer surplus modulo uh, um, some constant term that we can't get. But oftentimes when we're talking about simulating counterfactuals, we wanna know how is consumer surplus changing because of the counterfactual. And so then we can just use this expected consumer surplus expression, take the difference between that in the counterfactual and in the observed setting, and we get the change in expected consumer surplus. It's just this log sum term for uh, in the counterfactual minus the log sum term in the original choice setting. That's going to tell us how utility changes in expectation between the two settings. And then we just have to use that alpha parameter to scale it to, to money instead of utility. So this is another reason that the logit model is really nice is because we get these really simple, once again, these, if, you ha if you knew all the Vs, you could just calculate this, this thing pretty simply to get at welfare. Whereas in some other settings, calculating welfare is gonna be much more complicated. So this is one benefit of the logit model is these counterfactual simulations are relatively easy to, to think about and, and calculate outcomes of both choices and consumer surplus. All right, we're gonna have one last video where I'm gonna talk about some kind of extra empirical considerations when using the logit model.